Let's pray. Father, we come to thy presence to your son, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. As he has said that we two or three gather in his name and pray and it will be done. Lord, we join our hearts, our minds, and we come to thy presence, Lord, bringing up our brethren, brethren to thy throne of mercy. Especially, we bring uh, Linda and uh, Nelson, Lord, who are going through severe health issues. I pray that your grace may be upon them, Lord. And also we remember Surya Murthy, Lord, your grace may be upon them. And uh, your healing hand may touch them and heal them completely, O oh God. Grant them the strength. And uh, by your spirit, Lord, I pray that you work in their bodies, that they may be able to respond to the medicine well and may recover and may bless your name, Lord. This, name, this moment, we also remember our brethren in Myanmar who are not only suffering COVID-related issues, but also uh, instability in the in the country of God. Lord, I pray, I pray for your protection around them, that they may not be affected by the virus, not only really that, even by the things that are happening around them, O oh Lord. You provide them, reach out to their needs, and you protect them, and let your presence be with them always, O oh God. Lord, we, are, we also uh, pray for this moment as we're going to spend some time in the meditation of your word. We ask for your leading and guidance and our meditations on our discussions may edify our brethren and may bring glory to your name. We want to hear your voice, O oh God. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Praveen, for leading us in the prayer. And uh, I noticed Pauline has just joined us. Welcome, Pauline, to our uh, uh, weekly Bible study. And of course, Franklin Poppins, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, as we get into our study today, I just wanted to mention last time we had studied the subject of eschatology, uh, which means the study of last things. Uh, primarily referring to the second coming of Christ. So what happens towards the end of the time that we know as it is today? What happens when the kingdom is established? Uh, so all of that is, you know, comes under this uh, theological term eschatology. Now, some of you requested that we do, do some study on each one of these aspects, like the second coming, the resurrection, the final judgment. And these three are mentioned in our We Believe series, and we thought we will handle those. But we're going to take a break from it and come back to it uh, when we are ready to present a proper, uh, you know, studied approach to these subjects. And I have roped in Praveen and Sachin to help me uh, doing these studies. So each one of us will take one subject and we will give you an overview of this. Uh, this will be maybe uh, a few weeks later as we gather the information and get ready for that. Instead today, I am moving to, uh, like we have said, a standalone subject and I had messaged you about the subject and the subject is called, or I, I title it, Facts About Demon Possession. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a subject that sort of, uh, uh, I came across not very long ago when I had a discussion with someone with regards to this. And I noticed that there is some gap in terms of, a biblical understanding of it. Uh, we all have our, you know, uh, thoughts about it, uh, doubts about it. We might also make some, you know, conclusions based not, ne not necessarily on the Bible, but, uh, you know, hearsay, uh, old wives' tales, uh, <laughs> things of that nature. So I thought maybe I will just take this particular session and talk about uh, this, this subject, facts about demon possession. Okay, 
So I'm going to share with you uh, some information uh, through the screen share, which I will go to at this moment. Uh, okay, let me just um, go ahead and expand that a bit. All right, now I presume that you can all see the screen. Someone confirmed that they can? Yes, okay. All right. All right, let me just widen my... Yeah, I can. I need to see some of you on my screen, otherwise I find it difficult to speak to a blank screen. Uh, okay. So facts about demon possession. Now what happens is, especially for uh, us Christians, uh, we tend to fall under uh, two, or uh, yeah, we, we, we sort of get into two pitfalls. We can take two extreme positions. And uh, let me put that on the screen. The two extreme positions, unfortunately, some of us who are Christians, can take is sometimes some people give undue uh, and sensational attention to the devil and the subject of demonism, right? We go to such an extreme where uh, there is too much of an obsessive focus on what the devil is doing and what demons are doing. We attribute everything to uh, the demons. And I don't think that is a balanced view or at least a biblical view. Uh, we should not be giving so much of importance to the devil. And the reason I say that is, if you read the scriptures, how much of the devil is mentioned? Now, there is a mention of him and the demoniacal world, but the Bible doesn't go to such a large extreme, you know, such an extreme to talk about demons so much. So that is one thing we have to avoid. But on the other hand, we can uh, go to another extreme where we avoid the subject completely, where there is no mention of demons or devils. We don't try to understand that there can be very strong influences that we can fall under. Uh, we can be oppressed. That's the word that we will unpack a little bit uh, as we go along. Uh, sometimes we can become too uh, you know, lackadaisical with regards to uh, the subject, uh, and we don't give it the necessary importance that is, uh, you know, required. So, how can we get a balanced perspective? All right, so let's not go to these two extreme positions. Let us look at what the scriptures tell us. All right, so. As we do that, for, to do that, I want to first establish the fact, just in case there is any doubt, that demon possession uh, is real. In, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and uh, healed all the sick. So very clearly, uh, there is a mention of uh, possession, demon possession. Jesus Christ, uh, you know, was uh, driving out demons. Uh, he, you know, freed people from demon oppression and possession. So it is real. We cannot avoid the subject because it is mentioned in the scriptures. But on the other hand, like I mentioned earlier, we must be careful that we go, don't go to another extreme. Now, let me make a distinction between um, two terms that we are going to use. Now, this is not necessarily, you know, uh, straight away from the Bible. The Bible uses these terms interchangeably as we can see the scriptures also doing that all right uh, there is a distinction and let's un let's understand what possession means first demon possession i'm reading from the uh, uh, from the screen demon possession is when satan gets control of a person by taking residence 
in the person body uh, to corroborate this is a scripture Luke 8 verse 27 it says when Jesus stepped ashore he was met by a demon possessed man from the town for a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house but had lived in the tombs many times it had seized him and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places you notice very clearly there uh the person has lost the faculty of being able to control himself. He's been controlled by an external force. And we know that the external force is demons uh, or the devil himself. Uh, he's being driven by the demons into solitary places. He lives in a way where he's not, uh, he's not aware of the fact that he is without clothes living in tombs so obviously you can see that the person has lost control so when when possession takes place uh, demons take residence in the person right where the individual has lost control as opposed to possession uh, let's look at what oppression means once again reading from the screen oppression is when satan influences a person through deception temptation human weaknesses, human brokenness, addictions, etc. Once again, the scripture I would use to, uh, you know, uh, to attest to this is, is in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, and you, he made alive, talking about Christians, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You can see the difference here. Here, the external force is very clearly mentioned according to the prince of the power of the air and we would uh, and it also identifies it as the spirit who now works so we can very clearly identify that as demoniacal forces but notice what is the uh, what is the force being applied here working in the sons of disobedience right uh, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh. So the pull, the influence is through the human weaknesses that we have, the lusts that we struggle with on a daily basis, right? Uh, the wrathful, you know, uh, paths that sometimes we tend to walk uh, under uh, or walk on. Uh, so the influence is very strong by demons exploiting human weaknesses, human brokenness. Uh, we could have certain weaknesses which could be more pronounced than what others have. And Satan can work on those weaknesses. Satan can exploit those weaknesses. That is called oppression. Notice it doesn't, uh, it, uh, it doesn't mention that the demon is controlling the individual like we saw in the previous slide where possession actually controls the person. But oppression doesn't control, but influences a very, very strong force uh, directing the person into disobedience. So uh, the conclusion we would like to make, I, I, uh, I would like to make is that demon possession is not necessarily demon oppression. Now, demon oppression could lead to demon possession, but I think there is a need for us to uh, make a distinction between the two. And secondly, many are demon oppressed, but not demon possessed, right? So I hope you see the, uh, the difference between the two. We must be careful that we don't uh, 
you know, unnecessarily uh, diagnose somebody as demon uh, possessed. And that is unfortunately what is happening also in the Christian world. We tend to be too quick to make judgments. We tend to be too quick to conclude that the person is demon possessed and then we get into all kinds of problems. I know of a particular case that I read of where a lady, a teenage girl, I think it was, who struggled with depression. And when she used to go into these episodes of depression, uh, she would curl herself up and take a fetal position. You know, uh, uh, she used to sort of try to, uh, for some reason, shut herself down in this fetal position. And so some people thought, oh, she's got some demon inside of her, which unfortunately was not correct. Uh, she was going through some kind of a, you know, uh, very uh, acute depression. And maybe the fetal position that she was taking was probably where she felt some sense of security, some self, some sense of uh, protection, you know, like uh, a, a little fetus in a womb. Uh, but people trying to diagnose that a demon possession is, is, is very unfortunate. All right. So we have to be careful about this. And I'll come back to that a little more. Uh, uh, you know, a little later. But since we're talking about demon possession, the question that you might have in mind is, well, how do we recognize demon possession? So that's the next thought we will uh, study at this time. How to recognize demon possession? Now, some of these thoughts that I'm going to present to you is definitely biblical. Some may be out of studies that people have made. Uh, like I will be quoting uh, Dr. Martha uh, Iluka. Uh, she has, uh, she is an MD, uh, a, a, a you know, a qualified doctor, as well as has an MDiv for a combination. Uh, she has a theological degree, and she's did, done some studies on this. And uh, here are some thoughts I'd like to present to you, where we can recognize demon possession. First one, demon may speak through the victim. All right. And uh, it is possible that the demons uh, can, uh, remember, possession is where the demon takes control of the individual. And the demon can actually speak through the victim. The victim has, does not or may not be aware of what is actually taking place. So this is possible. Uh, secondly, demon uh, may manifest its presence through person possessing incredible, unusual strength disproportionate to the size of the person, right? In other words, uh, the individuals uh, can, the individual or the victim can possess strength, which uh, is just not possible, you know, uh, normally uh, with regards to an individual like that. Uh, in this respect, uh, I remember Mr. Joseph, uh, Dr. Joseph Tikach, our former president of our fellowship, uh, in one of his presentations, he was mentioning how he had come across one individual who he believes was demon-possessed. Uh, he was actually counseling the person. And at a point in time, uh, as the session was progressing, uh, this person became extremely angry and suddenly, uh, you know, got up, uh, literally pulled off the curtain rod from the uh, uh, you know, the curtain that, you know, the rod that was uh, holding up the curtain, he, he uh, tore it out of the wall and he flung it at Dr. Dikach. Uh, thankfully, it missed him and it went and embedded itself on the opposite wall, you know, opposite to the person. So that's the kind of strength that they can sometimes have, which could definitely be an indication of demon possession. Another point is they could have blasphemous and vulgar tongues. Uh, not now, not all vulgar uh, language is demon possession, but sometimes the extreme kind, uh, uh, in, you know, coupled with blasphemy, uh, you know, could be a indication of demon possession. Another one is uh, the person can be violent, causing self-harm, 
uh, the person can become suicidal. Uh, the person can, you know, be extremely dangerous uh, in terms of the violence that they can perpetrate. And uh, two more thoughts, fear, aversion, or acute hostility to the name of Jesus or the Bible. If this is present, when you mention the name of Jesus or uh, talk about the Bible or present a Bible or the, there is a Bible, they can show hostility towards it. They can show, you know, a sense of uh, aversion towards that. Uh, so that could be another in, in indication. And to diagnose one as demon possessed, usually all of the above should be present to conclude that the person is possessed normally. Now, it may not necessarily have to have all of this, uh, but normally uh, that there could be, uh, you know, all of these symptoms present. Okay, uh, let me just look at some scriptures, uh, uh, you know, in uh, confirmation of these points. Uh, you know, in Luke chapter 8, which we just read uh, a while ago, remember this person that Jesus had met uh, and first and foremost, we see he has no control of himself. Unusual strength. Notice he could actually break the chains that he was chained with, uh, right? And he had absolutely no faculties of mind. His mind was completely controlled. He would uh, be without clothing and live in the tombs. Uh, there is another scripture which I have not mentioned here, uh, where it says that this that there, there was this individual with demon possession. He would throw himself in a fire. In other words, he could. Um, oh, I think I've mentioned that scripture is there. I'll come to that in a moment. Okay. So unusual strength is something that we see biblically uh, is. Uh, you know, something that can point to demon possession. We mentioned about speaking through the victim. Notice the scripture in Mark chapter 1. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Notice the demon is speaking through the victim. Uh, so... Uh, that is also possible. Uh, one more thought. Remember I said that person can be suicidal. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 22, it says, it has often cast him into the fire, the person who is possessed by demons, has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Notice, so the suicidal tendency could be there. Now, once again, I want to make a clarification. Not all suicides are demon possessions. Uh, okay, we have to make sure that we don't that we don't uh, go to the extreme there. But it is possible that if the person has lost control, that the person can become self-destructive. Um, okay, so these are some um, of the scriptures that I use uh, in. Uh, what do you say, uh, in support of some of those points that are mentioned. Once again, I am just dealing with, uh, you know, uh, 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 basically a, a, an overview of these of the subject. We can go much deeper, but I, I, I wouldn't want to do that. Now let me go to uh, psychiatric conditions versus demon possession. Now this, the reason I want to do this is that uh, we have to be careful that we don't diagnose uh, any of, you know, anything as demon possession. They could be psychiatric conditions that morphs as symptoms of demon possession, which may not necessarily be true. Uh, the, such a person needs, you know, medical help, needs the uh, treatment by a qualified psychiatrist. And so... Uh, I want to just make a distinction here. Uh, and I think all of us must be aware of this. Now, I'm quoting from a paper written by Do Dr. Martha Iliuka. Uh, and uh, like I said, she is a qualified medical doctor and she's a theologian. And she has studied this subject and has some very good insights to give to us. Notice uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of her uh, 
quotations. She says, psychiatric and spiritual conditions may overlap. For example, disassociative identity disorder or DID, also known as multiple personality disorder or disassociative symptoms, that is trance-like mental states are psychiatric disorders, not demon possession. So these have been through you know, scientific research, been able to, they've been able to find out that certain mental conditions, certain, what do you say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the lack of uh, certain chemicals in the brain can cause some of these, and it is not necessarily uh, demon possession, all right? Uh, another quotation from her, other overlapping symptoms include prolonged memory gaps and hallucinations, both often present with a history of complex childhood trauma. So sometimes childhood trauma and some experiences that we might have had in life can cause certain psychiatric conditions. It can cause psychological disorder. And some of those could, uh, could uh, manifest itself through hallucinations or prolonged memory gaps. Sometimes you tend to completely forget. Uh, so these are all psychiatric conditions, not necessarily uh, you know, demon possession. And finally, one more thought, delusions and paranoid hallucinations are also common psychiatric disorders, right? Hallucination, uh, you see things, you imagine things, uh, you think something is happening which is not happening. These are all, uh, you know, could be psychiatric disorders. And uh, Dr. Martha Eluka, I, I mentioned the name there, mentions that, uh, we must be careful that we don't make wrong diagnosis uh, with regards to this. And she also goes on to warn us with regards to the consequence of this misdiagnosis. Let me read to you what she says. A misdiagnosis can have dire social stigma and emotional consequences for the victim and their loved ones. It can cause acute trauma for the patient and may lead to distress, dysfunction, and stigma for life. Unfortunately, medical care for the patient is neglected and may be handicapped for life. So we have to be careful that we don't uh, become too ambitious with regards to diagnosing some, someone as, you know, uh, you know demon-possessed. Can you imagine diagnosing someone as that? And then it is not true. And I have a personal story to tell you with regards to somebody that I had uh, counseled. And uh, the person was, you know, hearing uh, voices. And he was imagining uh, things happening, uh, which actually was not true. He had social distress he was finding it difficult to be in social occasions and he and he would he would think that he was hearing voices when he used to uh, go into public he used to think that people are looking at him passing comments at him and uh, they are probably going to harm him so he had this major problem and there were uh, he was diagnosed as uh, demon possessed and there were a whole bunch of pastors who tried to pray for him and uh, do all kinds of exorcism on him. And he was traumatized. Nothing was happening. He was not being healed. And, uh, and I had the, uh, you know, he had come to me for counseling and I asked him, have you seen a psychiatrist? Have you been to a doctor who could diagnose what is actually happening. And uh, I had uh, then recommended him to someone he could see, and he was diagnosed as schizophrenia. I think you've heard that, schizophrenic, uh, who hears voices, imagines things. And he was put on medication, and he is basically fine. He's not entirely fine, but he is much better today. 
Uh, and I was just thinking to myself how unfortunate that he was diagnosed as demon possessed and he was traumatized by all kinds of strange behaviors by these pastors, uh, which, and who, who was not actually helping him. He was going into further trauma. And thankfully, uh, while he was, uh, as he was treated, uh, he was able to get back to normal life, uh, function normally because of some medical condition that he had, all right? So that is the uh, unfortunate uh, consequence of misdiagnosis and we have to be careful. Some, some people can be handicapped for life. Can you imagine some young person being said or being told, oh, he's, or he or she is demon possessed. And what will happen to that person if others know, oh, this, could, this person could be demon possessed? It, it, it just shatters the person's life. And so we have to be careful. Now, I'm not saying it may not be, but we have to be careful that we don't go too quickly and diagnose that as demon possession. One more uh, slide I will share with you and then we can stop for discussions. Biblical understanding, let me just give you some biblical understanding with regards to this subject. The first point I'd like to share with you is, let's understand that a Christian in whom the Holy Spirit dwells may be oppressed, remember the oppression, possession, uh, distinction we made, may be oppressed, but, but usually is not possessed. If we are practicing Christians in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, you cannot also have the uh, demon living side by side the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, that just doesn't happen. Uh, we can be oppressed, we can be tempted by demons, we can be influenced by demons, but we cannot be possessed, at least as much as I understand. Maybe we don't have to fear. And there's a scripture that tells us we don't have to fear demons, you know, because we are being told in Colossians 1 and verse 13, like I uh, put on the screen there, we have been delivered from the power of darkness. We as disciples of Jesus who have come under the blood of Jesus has been delivered from the power of darkness. We have no need to fear the demoniacal world, but we must keep away from them, obviously. We must resist temptation, but we, must, we, need, to, we need not fear. That doesn't mean to say that we will make mistakes and fall many times, but the Holy Spirit protects us. The blood of Jesus continues to cover us and we are saved through the blood of Christ our Lord and his sacrifice for us. I also mentioned Numbers 23, verse 23. That's the scripture in which uh, I've forgotten to see it exactly. But you remember, it's actually mentioned there is no divination against Israel. You remember there was this prophet, was it Balaam or someone uh, who was asked to curse Israel? Okay, the ancient nation of Israel. I'm not talking about the current nation of Israel. <laughs> they are going through their own problems. But the ancient nation of Israel, uh, you know, uh, some, some pagan kings uh, wanted them to be cursed. But this prophet or this, uh, you know, so-called prophet could not do it. Why? Because it says clearly there is no divination against Israel. Similarly, there is no divination against a disciple of Jesus. We are Christians in the protection of the Holy Spirit. And we, and we need not fear uh, the powers of darkness and de the demoniacal world. In John 1 and verse, uh, 1 John verse uh, 4 verse 4, it says, greater is he in us than the one in the world. Obviously referring to, you know, God in us. And the one in the world is Satan, who is, you know, deceiving the world. But we have a greater power in us. And we can rest, be rest assured that power, you know, will not allow us to fall under the possession and trap of Satan the devil. Finally, one more thought. Possession of a Christian may take place only if the person has renounced Christ or has dabbled in Satanism or occultic practices or has invited Satan into their lives. In other words, if a person has completely renounced his, you know, discipleship, 
he has cursed Jesus and he has left the faith and has now gone into, you know, deliberately gone into satanic, uh, you know, uh, kind of activities, especially occult practices. Then, of course, uh, the person has opened himself to demoniacal, uh, not only oppression, but possession. And that is where we have to be very careful that we don't get into those kinds of activities. Well, I'm going to leave it there. There's so much more to say about it, but uh, I'm going to uh, allow you to bring in your thoughts. Uh, please feel free to make any comments you'd like or uh, any questions that you might have. The floor is open at this time. Pastor, can I say something? Vanessa, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Mark 9, verse 22. Yes. So uh, that does, does the demon or the person ask for help? Is it the demon and the person asking for the help or is the person himself asking for help? Okay. Can you just read that verse? I, I don't have it readily with me. Mark you have it on your number? screen. On your screen. Oh, okay. Uh, it was sharing with us. Yeah, that was Mark chapter 9. Uh, let me see. Uh, Mark 9, 22. Mark 9, 22. Uh, was it 22? Yeah, Mark, no, Mark 9 verse 22 says, And many times it has thrown him into the fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Um so does, uh, does when 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 the demon possesses a person, does the demon ask for the help or does the person <laughs> himself ask for the help? Okay, no, actually, if you go back to verse 20, uh, if it says in verse 20, so they brought the boy to him. Uh, when the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled. Uh, around, foaming at the mouth. Verse 21, how long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said, and it is the father who is replying, not the demon. <laughs> okay. okay. So, uh, so what I want to know also is that, see, we, we pray, we pray and we ask God to have mercy on all the souls that have departed because there is a day, a judgment day. Okay. So on judgment day, everybody will be judged. So we, we ask God to have mercy on their souls, give them at least one chance so that on their judgment day, at least he, they will join God and his army of angels. So maybe if, if the demons that are really wanting to change, supposing it is they who are possessing the people and they are asking for help, is it possible? Okay. All right. Well, we are going into speculation now uh, because the Bible does not give us a very clear answer to that. Uh, there is no indication in the scriptures that demons ask or demons repent and ask for mercy. <laughs> At least there is no indication of it. I don't know what the reality is going to be in the final judgment. Uh, we will mm -hmm. probably come back to that when we do eschatology again. Uh, but with regards to what happens to demons, their final fate, uh, whether some of them will repent, uh, can they repent? I, I, I don't know, uh, Vanessa, and I don't think the scriptures give us uh, a clear answer to that. Okay, okay. Another, another question. I have yes. actually three questions to ask. All so right. the qu second question was that, uh, like uh, Satan, okay, so when Satan wanted to, uh, uh, he, he told Jesus, like Job, the story of Job. Yeah. Uh, Jesus himself gave, uh, or God himself gave Satan the permission to do with Job as he wished. So yeah. the same way is God giving the permission to Satan to enter a certain po uh, person or do his wish? Okay. <clears throat> See, the way I understand that is that Satan cannot do anything uh, that he is not permitted by God, right? Uh, 
Uh, in other words, Satan does not have omnipotent powers. Uh, Satan always comes <laughs> under the rulership and the sovereignty of God. So uh, what we witness in the book of Job is that Satan wanted to completely destroy Job. And if you give him a chance, he'll destroy all of us too. But he has no power to do that uh, because God is sovereign and is over him. So that is how we understand that. Uh, but remember, we as human beings have our own uh, you know, volition. Uh, uh, we can make decisions. And if we allow ourselves to, or, or rather open ourselves to satanic influences, then we are inviting satanic influences or possession into our lives. It's not that God is allowing that. Uh, we are allowing ourselves because we have the, the freedom to choose. We, we have free moral agency. So it is not God who is asking someone to go into, you know, and possess someone. It is we who are opening ourselves to that kind of influence. Okay, that's as much as I can say. Once again, uh, there are uh, some gaps in our understanding on that. It, does it help, Vanessa? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. third question. <laughs> Only three I had. So the third question is that uh, the Holy Spirit dwells only in Christians or does the Holy Spirit dwell in each and every person? Now, Okay, God God has made Christians, non-Christian, idol worshippers and people who worship him. But I think everyone knows that there is one God and I think the Holy Spirit is dwelling in each and every one. All right. Because, uh, because yeah. I, I'll tell uh, just one sec. Because uh, from childhood, I, I know the uh, Catholic way of life, living of life, the Bible, and we, we never got, never ever got into the part of the Holy Spirit. It's just that recently, maybe in this past one year, I have come to know the Holy Spirit. I have started praying to the Holy Spirit, asking for guidance and everything. Otherwise, so many years of my life, I never ever knew about the Holy Spirit and the, the major role that he plays in my life and in the Bible. So yeah. uh, what I mean to say is that, that the Holy Spirit was still dwelling in me, even though I, I never knew about him, or I was not taught or told about him. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, let me see if I can uh, uh, give you an answer, which, what's, you know, which is not very comprehensive, but let me attempt. Uh, what I can say is, the Holy Spirit is available to all of humanity. But whether the Holy Spirit resides in every person is now, a, 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 you know, I would say debatable. Because uh, the Bible says that we can resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can uh, grieve the Holy Spirit. So there may be many people who may not invite the Holy Spirit into them even though the Holy Spirit is available to all, Jesus Christ, through his ministry, has made the Holy Spirit available to all. But whether the Holy Spirit is in every person is, once again, it's not for me to answer. But I know that the Holy Spirit is available for me. I, I daily pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to fill me so that I may, you know, uh, be a glorify God in my life. Yeah, you mentioned about Catholicism. Uh, once again, uh, we have to be you know, uh, just because you don't know about the Holy Spirit or probably, you know, never uh, or taught about the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily mean that the Holy Spirit cannot guide you, influence you, strengthen you, uh, even though, you know, it doesn't matter which denomination you belong, whether you belong to the Catholic or any other. We are Christians. We believe in Christ. And so we go above the denomination, you know, as a true church. The church is not just a denomination. A church is, uh, you know, disciples of Jesus who believe in Christ. Okay. Uh, that's as much as I can say. I don't know if anybody else would like to uh, venture an answer to that question. Yes, Anil, go ahead. 
Uh, see, when you uh, put your faith in Christ, when you accept Jesus as your savior, that is, you know, that's the time when you are actually uh, becoming a Christian, so to say. And isn't that the time when the Holy Spirit really enables you forward in living a Christian life? So I thought once you accept Jesus as your savior, the Holy Spirit is in you and guiding you. Um, yeah, once again, you know, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, shades of gray there, you know. Uh, that does not mean to say the Holy Spirit hasn't been guiding you before. I mean, if you read the Old Testament, uh, you can see God guiding even pagan uh, kings. Uh, and it can be done through the Holy Spirit, right? But the only difference that I thought was in, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was with you, guiding them. Yeah. And in the New Testament era, the Holy Spirit is in you. That's yes. what you said, right? Yes, that is how we have tried to explain it. I don't know if we have any other language to say it today. Uh, we always say the Holy Spirit is uh, definitely with you. But once we invite, you know, get baptized and uh, allow the Holy Spirit, or rather invite the Holy Spirit in us, then it is in us. Uh, well, you know, once again, uh, those distinctions are just a little uh, hard to explain, but I can only definitely say that when we have accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit is in us. Now, how the Holy Spirit works before that, once again, we can speculate. I don't know if I can have any particular, you know, uh, answer nailed down to it. But anybody else have any thoughts on that, uh, on the Holy Spirit? I'm glad we're talking about the Holy Spirit more now. Praveen, if you have any thoughts left, please come in. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'm quoting from the first epistle of 1 John, uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. 1 John, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, where it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is uh, in the world. And uh, chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, yeah. Can you just help us with that scripture, Mr. Zechariah? Uh, yes, uh, that, you know, once again, that's a very good scripture to read. Uh, basically, the scripture, uh, once again, is very clearly stating that if we have the Holy Spirit, we will, we will, uh, what do you say, uh, affirm Christ, we will attest to Christ, we will confess Christ in our lives, right? And if we don't, obviously, we, uh, you know, it is not of the Holy Spirit. So to that extent, it's very clear that if we are being influenced and we have the Holy Spirit in us, we will uh, believe and trust and give allegiance to Christ. Okay. It specifically okay. mentions every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the uh, Christ in, in, you know, the, the, the fact that there is an incarnation, the fact that he is deity, uh, we will not uh, what you say, uh, go against the deity of Christ. Uh, basically, we worship Christ. So anyone who says that Jesus is not God, he's just a man, then there's a problem. Or that he is just God and not man, then there's a problem. So, uh, yeah, it's basically mentioning that. Thank you. Okay, Ravin, go ahead. Yeah, coming coming to this question, uh, whether Holy Spirit resides in uh, 
renounce a non believer or non christian uh, the thought i would like to share is uh, not any dogmatic thing but uh, maybe we can also think in this perspective um uh, and definitely it is not about uh, this is a stand from gcs side or any of those okay just a thought we can think about if you consider so holy spirit in us as residents of like like the presence of the holy spirit like uh, we have three rooms here i'm living in one room in these kind of physical dimensions we talk about uh, dimensions right so if we speak in that sense holy spirit is living in somebody is not living in somebody which uh, which tells that he is not omnipresent so if you talk the presence of holy spirit uh, as in this two dimensional way so we have to admit that spirit is in everyone because he is omnipresent and the second thing which the bible uses the word holy spirit is in you christ in you okay i would like to relate these these are not just the words used only for us and the god or us and christ and holy spirit this is the language used in description of the trinity itself father is in the son son is in the father and in john chapter 17 if we read he brings the same explanation that father is in us and we in him jesus prays they may be in us and we in them and they may be one as we are one so it direct if you if you look at this this is totally talking about a relational dimension if you talk about the presence of the holy spirit if you talk about holy spirit in us in relational dimension then definitely he is not in some people in relational dimension because they are not in relationship with him yet <laughs> the relationship is not complete yet so holy spirit is not in them he is in only the christians who put their faith in jesus so what i would what i would like to tell is if we consider the presence of the if we can sorry if you consider the word holy spirit in us the uh, holy spirit is in people in two dimensional world as the presence the physical presence as i am then he has to be everywhere and if we consider in the relational dimension definitely there will be people who put their faith in him they have relationship and he is with them and people who are not there so this is a language uh, the new testament uses and all people don't use this language actually only two people uses and mostly john uses this language holy spirit is in us and we in him and apostle paul uses in some places so when we uh, yeah, sorry in order to understand this we need, we have to look at their entire theology and their perspective they if we do that we understand these two are the authors in the entire new testament who are very strongly relational so we understand holy spirit in you christ in you and these are relational uh, they are in relational dimension and in that way we have to look at so this is a thought thank you praveen i think uh, that's helpful you know there is a scripture in the book of acts that says that uh, you know uh, in him we live and move and have our being in other words it is god sustains the universe and in that respect god is in all of us right uh, if otherwise we are uh, we would cease to exist but from a from an allegiance relational sense that praveen explained as well as what bertram uh, read from the scriptures we may have a relationship with or we may not in that respect we are not uh, you know in tune with the holy spirit but we cannot say that the holy spirit is uh, not in us in the sense that he is not sustaining us he, uh, god is the one who sustains the whole universe oh hello um am i audible pastor good evening everybody uh yes um um pastor what i would like to ask is uh if god also was tempted several times we know that so now if we are um, we have a, the holy spirit in us 
and uh, we are very prayerful and uh, you know we tend more on the, uh, the holy spirit side then at every point uh, is there always a tussle does the evil spirit try to you know tempt us or break that and if it is a yes what is the percentage because what i heard to continue on the same note um i uh, remember from the recesses of my mind wherein the roman catholic priest are you know too much for hours together into prayer or uh, things like that that means um, they, they are uh, in in the presence of uh, god and uh, the holy spirit is in them and uh, just as you mentioned our chief dikash as um, you know um, and you as well um, you know you because of the holy spirit we are able to heal people who are uh, you know possessed uh, help them rather beside the psychiatric so what i'm asking you simple is the more holy spirit is is it more temptation the more evil spirit tries to enter into us or tempt us or whatever the word is um well i can i can only say that uh, uh like we discussed about oppression yes though you have the holy spirit though you are in relationship with god uh, you can still be tempted in this world uh, and in this you know in this existential situation we can still be tem- tempted uh, of, by our own weaknesses by our flesh and by satan the devil because he is trying to deceive so that is possible now with regards to you said what percentage uh, i can, uh, that, that of course uh, once again goes into physical dimensions and we are talking about a spiritual dimension so we cannot talk about percentage no, no the spiritual uh, i meant the spiritual itself uh, i put out the question in a very layman perspective so at that point what i understand is when we are tempted because we are all humans uh the the holy spirit would um you know overpower would play more uh, the the forces would be more stronger well yes i mean it, uh it 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 depends on your own um what do you say submission to the leading of the holy spirit uh you can uh sometimes not submit you may submit to your weakness you may submit to the temptation uh so uh, it depends how you are interacting in that particular time uh with the leading of the holy spirit or the temptation of the uh of the evil spirit but yes it is true that uh though you have the holy spirit you live in a world where we can be tempted yes bertram you had a thought yeah the scriptures <laughs> mention uh that there is no temptation taken you but that which is common to man uh but uh, god is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted more than you can bear and with every temptation he shows you a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it yeah yeah that's a good one thank you i hope uh, pauline that helps yeah yes pastor oh, okay and thank you I, i just noticed the time is just uh, flown off flown past we are over time uh let's stop there for the moment but uh, as always at any time if there are any lingering questions or comments feel free to send us a send me a comment i mean to say a message on whatsapp uh, and uh, i can always come back to you on that thank you very much for joining us uh, god bless you and let's uh, close with a prayer uh, let me see um, uh, can i request bertram can you lead us in a closing prayer yes <clears throat> let's bow our heads father god we just thank you for this time of bible study where we receive your words lord we uh, uh we uh, consider your words lord we have questions asked and by your holy spirit lord we receive answers uh, which are truthful and right for us lord we are learning and growing thank you for this opportunity lord that you bring us together make it possible for us lord and uh, uh, continue to do so lord so that uh, we may grow more and more to be christ like holy spirit help us to overcome our weaknesses help us lord to bring glory and honor to you lord for your word is the truth and your word prevails forever 
we just want to thank you, Lord, for your many blessings that uh, come to us, Lord. We acknowledge it. And thank you, Lord, that, uh, uh, that you are blessing us, Lord, and watching over us as a dear God and Father. Thank you very much for this uh, truth and using your servant, Lord, our pastor, uh, Mr. Danny Zachariah, Lord, to teach us and preach your word to us, Lord, faithfully. Bless him and his family, Lord, as also each and everyone present here. And Lord, take care of your people, Lord, that we may be continually, uh, Lord, our eyes towards you. And Lord, we wait upon you and call upon your name, Lord, and uh, continue to live, uh, Lord, a faithful life. We pray this prayer, Mother God, in Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you all. Have a good day.